we, we need a trauma-informed society, you know. And we need a trauma-informed and an eco-informed society, you know. And uh, if we don't go down that road, our, our arrogant species is finished. Mm. Hello, and welcome to Locked Up Living, the podcast which looks at resilience in challenging organisations, such as, but not only, prisons and hospitals for mentally ill prisoners and patients. My name is David Jones, and together with Naomi Murphy, I present your Locked Up Living podcast. So our next guest is another where on first glance it might seem as if we have deviated from our stated aims of exploring barriers to and opportunities for well-being and growth within harsh institutions. However, we're hoping that looking at these issues from another tangentially related angle might shed some sights into our more traditional areas of exploration. Our guest today, Simon Partridge, describes himself as a disillusioned ex analysand and a freelance writer-researcher. He has covered community broadcasting, devolved politics, the British-Irish conflict, ethno-cultural mingling across the islands of Britain and Ireland, the psychobiological consequences of detached upper-class child-rearing and boarding residential schools, intergenerational war trauma and developmental trauma, complex PTSD. He posts on Boarding School Survivors Facebook and is a founding member of the London Adverse Childhood Experiences Hub, which we'll post a link to in our show notes. He continues to explore and write from lived experience about the linkage between early attachment deficits and ACEs. Welcome along today, Simon. Thanks for joining us. Pleased to be here. Hello, Simon. I'm very pleased to meet you. That's quite some introduction that uh, Naomi has given you there. I'm very impressed. I mean, so, Simon, you've been pretty active in speaking up about trauma in the upper classes. Can you tell us something about your journey to this and, and why you're interested in it? Uh, well, David, I, I think it comes back to trying to um, sort out what what made me and unmade me or didn't make me in the first place. Um, and uh, I think my kind of serious um investigation started after my last analysis ended or I, or I brought it to an end um, in about 2004 uh, when I kind of realised there was a sort of pattern that my analyses seemed to last about seven years which was the age I went off to boarding school um, I actually went slightly younger to weekly boarding school but I was still six um, and then I came across the work of Joy Shaverin who um, was already starting to write, a Jungian psychotherapist, starting to write about the effects of boarding school. I started to make some links, and um, I think at the same time I was also exploring um, work by John Bowlby, um, and also Sue Gerhardt was very important at that point. Um, she wrote a lovely little book, which you may be familiar with, I Love Matters, mm. um, which tied, tied together to me for the first time really some of the um, psycho-neurobiology and, and the trauma. So that, that's really where it started. Thank you. Um, can you just tell us something about the sort of quality of the experience that you had in mind um, in, in reflecting upon this? Um... Well, I suppose it was, um, in a sense, uh, despite, you know, the kind of rather seamless um, autobiography which Naomi read out, um, it wasn't quite like that in real life, you know. Hmm. Um, I was a sort of itinerant writer um, who found it very difficult to um, hold myself together in lots of ways. I I mean, I think I probably resorted to writing because it was something that... um, I could manage sort of intermittently, you know, and and outside a very formal structure, which I don't function well in. Um, so, and I had, a, I've always had a number of sort of um, that lovely phrase, medically unexplained symptoms, you know. Um, so I've I've kind of felt um, uh, sort of rather dissociated, estranged from my body, um, uncomfortable. 
unable to find a place of safety. Um, and uh, I think I've been sort of driven in a way to try and um, unpack that and sort out what the causes were. Um, I mean, I, it might be summed up in, as a sort of state of um, rather general discomfort and um, problems in, in relationships. Um, so it's, you know, I, I suppose I've been trying to explore what, what, what lies behind that, what, what um, try and make some sense of it and, and maybe try and, and be a bit more coherent. Thank you. I think, I think that's a very um, colourful uh, description, um, really. So you've been involved in the group Boarding School Action, but you seem to be much more interested in what happens before a child get sent to boarding school. So are you saying really that those experiences get compounded by uh, being at boarding school? Um, well, I'm not only involved in boarding school action, I'm, I'm involved in another Facebook group called Boarding School Survivors. So um, actually I probably spend a lot more time there than I do at boarding school action. Um, I think what what I've realised is, although I found the work of Joy Chavrin and Nick Buffle very helpful, and I went on one of Nick's um, double weekend workshops uh, in 2006, which is when I, I think I started to unpack quite seriously what the um, boarding school dimension of my problem might be. Um, but uh, going back beyond that really took, it's taken me quite a long time. It's a sort of... Um, retrospective journey if you like um, so it, it's I wouldn't say it's that I'm, I'm more interested in it but I've, what I have realised is that it's I think if you just talk about boarding school syndrome um, for quite a lot of people it doesn't capture the full dimension of what's going on and um, I had a lot of I mean, this is where the um, disillusion ex analysis comes in if you like I mean I had a lot of um, orthodox psychoanalysis which certainly didn't get down to my early trauma um, and uh, I did end up finally with um, uh, a much more integrative um, psychotherapist who was into body stuff and, and by then I mean I had a much clearer idea of what I wanted you know it's it's it's, it's very difficult when you first go, go to a therapist I think because you're in a state of ignorance the, the therapist is the authority figure whether you like it or not it probably took me ten years to get to a point where I could say I want I want this from a from a, from, from a therapist, you know. Mm. So I was I wasn't going to be fobbed off anymore by a, an orthodox analyst who was only into transference. Mm -hmm. um, so in a way, it was it, it sort of took me um, it put me back to, to much earlier stuff, and you know it's absolutely awful if you're sent to boarding school at six or seven. But we all know that much happens in the developmental process. Before you get to six and seven, you know, and um, as I started to unpack that, um, help from this uh, my last therapist, I realised there were some very early experiences which had impacted me um, hugely. So, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm interested in knowing more about that because um, I've, I've never been to boarding school. Um, I was, I think, very fortunate in that I went to a grammar school in Watford, which I always thought was a bit like a, gram a boarding school, but without the boarding part of it, you know, it had fantastic... Some of them were modelled on boarding schools, <laughs> Indeed. no doubt. had fantastic facilities, physics labs, chemistry labs, massive, yeah. massive playing fields and a swimming pool, blah, 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 blah. So I thought I benefited a lot from that, but there was obviously something, some... Uh, element that was different from what you're thinking of as a boarding school. What, what do you think that is? Well, you were. I, I would suggest one of the basic differences. You you went home to your family at the end of the school day, didn't you? Yeah, of course. Well, that that is a, an enormous difference. Um, I've just written a little article for the um, Private Education Policy Forum, pointing out to them that they've been lumping together all private education if it's one phenomenon and uh, I mean I've, I've had a very pleasant um, reception from the editor 
who said we've never published anything like this before. I mean, to me, it's quite extraordinary because the psychosocial dynamics of a day school are completely different from a boarding school, hmm. particularly if you go, you know, at a, at a very early age. Um, so, I mean, I would say, David, that that is, you know, just no doubt there are other differences. But I think that is a kind of very stark difference which one can identify uh, immediately. Absolutely. I mean, if you think of how frightening and overwhelming it is for kids just to start day school, actually, and to be away from their mums and dads for, you know, for six hours, the thought of, you know, I can't even imagine, actually, how overwhelming and scary that could be. Uh, for a young child to be sent away and know you're not going to see your parents not just for six hours but for days weeks on end um you know uh, uh, yeah really quite overwhelming to even put yourself in that place really well i think i mean i think um i mean as you were saying that name the word devastating came into my head um and I, th- I think, you know, your, yours is a kind of very humane reaction. And I think a lot of women and mothers would, that would be their first um, first reaction. Mm-hmm. How, how on earth can you send your kids away at that age? Yeah. Um, but you see, if you look into the culture of the, the aristocracy in the upper class, it's the norm. And you were probably handed over to a nanny uh, very early on. I mean, that was the other thing I came across. But I think, you know, um, my mother just didn't have the parenting skills to motherly skills. Why should she if she'd been brought up in a rather similar circumstance? Mm -hmm. So one is sort of farmed out um, almost immediately. Um, And that's, I think, where um, there's enormous hidden damage um, in the the aristocracy and and, and the upper class, the ruling classes. Mm is, which is easily normalised under this uh, you know, slightly jokey phrase, the stiff upper lip. Yeah. Behind the stiff upper lip, there's, there's a emotional disaster. Yeah, and I, was, I, was, I was quite shocked when we had a, a previous guest on who spoke about wet nursing still being used, at, which, you know, I remember when I learned history at school, we were taught about that being something that happened in, um, you know, much, you know, centuries ago. I was quite shocked to hear that that, that was still happening. Um, and of course, actually, that's that's one of the ways it's promoted for, you know, bonding with your children. The, so the breastfeeding promotion is not just about the breast milk is good for the child but also that whole process you know and the promotion of for men also to have skin to skin contact with their their child so just thinking that even from the very early days it sounds like amongst some sections of society there would be that removal of that basic need that's there for children to ha- to have that really close physical contact with their parents uh, well, you've summed it up rather well. Um, uh, I suppose the the other thing I might put in there is the sort of whole whole issue of the um, hormone oxytocin, uh, the sort of love yeah. bond. Um, and in actual fact, yes, um, wet nursing was certainly going on in the early part of the 20th century. Churchill had a wet nurse, for instance. Mm-hmm. Um, Prophecy Coles has written a very interesting book about um uh, the role of, of, of mothers and surrogate mothers called the, the shadow of the second mother. And she unpacks the dynamics of wet nursing in a, in a very sensitive way um, and points out that not only... Well, it, has a, it can have a devastating effect on the, on the wet nurse child, also the children of the wet nurses, when you start to think about mm. it. Um, these are usually poor women from, from a rural background and it was, you know, one of the few ways they could earn, earn money. Um, here's another interesting fact which not many people know about. Freud's daughter had a wet nurse. And there's some implication that Freud himself had a wet nurse. Melanie Klein certainly had a wet nurse and has to make a connection between her intense interest in breasts yeah. and the fact she had a wet nurse. Yeah. It's not mentioned in the analytic literature at all. I had to do some sort of fairly original research partly with the help of Prophecy Coles to get get, the, get some handle on this. I mean, it, it's just totally ignored. Mm. It's 
Sorry, I'm, I'm getting a bit emotional. Maybe you can understand why. Yeah, absolutely. You know, absolutely. And so it sounds, you know, like for children from the upper class being sent away to boarding school, you know, there's there's damage and disadvantage to that to that kind of like arrangement of child rearing even before you're taken away from the farm a, a bit I suppose like when we think about children who get removed um, and are cared for via the local authority and so there's an association of being in children's homes with being quite damaging but most people are probably wise to the fact that um, children who are in care have already you know suffered neglect and possibly abuse to be in those circumstances when people are not really mindful of that when it comes to children who go to boarding school i suppose it's really this is where the where the issue of social background and class comes in um because yes it, it's it's so normalized um in the upper class that people don't ask those questions mm-hmm. um and it, it's a bit extraordinary really because if you could see the neglect in the upper class, people would say, why do we let this go on? Mm. It's much easier to project it onto poorer people uh, who, who have evidently, you know, um, disadvantages in their lives. And for often, for reasons beyond their control, can't really look after their children very well. But we're actually talking about a group of people who, who have um, plenty of financial resources but in actual fact, don't know how to um, uh, provide the emotional support that children need. But there's, there is a kind of added um, complication, I think, which um, very interesting attachment uh, oriented therapist Anne Power has pointed out. And she's, she says, and I, I, I've come to agree with her, although initially she, she, she was quite critical of some of the stuff I wrote. She said, one of the things you do learn in an upper class environment is this. Um, kind of uh, learnt avoidance. You lived in this rather detached family background. Um, uh, emotions are um, uh, dampened down. There is a lack of physical contact, um, and, you know, which feeds into this phrase, the stiff upper lip. But in some ways, actually, prepares you quite well being sent away to school. You have the avoidant defences, um, which maybe people from a less um, upper class background don't have. And one of the things I've I've come to see is that I think that, um, and this is something I picked up from the boarding school survivors Facebook page, um, is that the people who seem to have the most extreme reaction to boarding school weren't the people from an upper class background. There were people who had been sent to boarding school. Uh, for other reasons that, you know, their, their, their parents were in the forces, mm-hmm. they were overseas. Um, occasionally it was, it was somebody who was very aspirational, who, who, whose parents had made a lot of money quite quickly and wanted to send their kids to, to um, the boarding school for the um, social advantages um, that, that does bring. Um, so I think that... Um, it, it's quite complicated in that sense. I, I think one of the problems with um, a sort of narrow view of boarding school syndrome is it doesn't really explain uh, how, in actual fact, so many people seem to grow through the system without too much of a problem, um, overtly anyway. Um, so this, this is what I've come to call uh, the British upper class complex trauma condition, mm-hmm. because I think it does need to be named and recognised it's much more difficult to see than, than somebody who's clearly in, in sort of um, uh, you know uh, emotional pain and, and, and overt uh, dysfunction um, you know, I, w- I would say somebody like uh, Boris Johnson clearly has dissociative symptoms which I think anybody who knows a bit about psychology can spot mm-hmm. you know he's in his incapacity to in engage face to face for more than about 10 seconds he turns away um, and you, if you see him interviewed mm-hmm. um, not to mention the disorganization of his own private life um, you know but, but he functions in, in a way and and he functions with, with minimal criticism mm-hmm. um, so you know the norms are kind of coming in in a way um, 
Now, why doesn't Andrew Marr actually say to him, look, Mr. Johnson, could you please look at me for more than 10 seconds? Mm-hmm. <laughs> it would be impolite, wouldn't mm-hmm. it, really? Well, I, th- I think that's a really good observation because I think a lot of the people that we encounter um, who perhaps have you know, been in care, what have you, they've often come from families where they've had very limited means of coping with their with their overwhelming emotions so perhaps used um drink or drugs or um criminal behavior in order to you know violence in order to act out their emotions where you know just think about how we promote learning i mean i use learning myself as a as a way of coping and intellectualization is a good strategy isn't it and it keeps you in a part of the brain where you're much more in in control in some ways um, and I guess for you know families that go to book for kids that go to boarding school that's that's really promoted they're in an environment where that what that single coping resource is really heavily promoted and I think you know we do see people in um, custody in the criminal justice system occasionally who've been to boarding school but obviously they're few and far between even though you know the amount of of pain that the child has experienced is it might well be very comparable um but they've had different coping resources promoted for them most probably so not ended up in in committing um crimes or certainly um certainly not the typical crimes that bring people into prison yes i'm i'm sure the um uh the reasons people end up in prison are, are kind of quite diverse. I mean, I, I'd be quite interested to know that people you come across from boarding school in prison, I, I would also like to know what their social background is. I mean, I suspect it may not be typical about mm-hmm. the fact that upper class entrance to boarding school. I mean, that might be quite an interesting thing to, to pursue. Mm-hmm. Um, yes, I mean, you mentioned acting out, but we know also that the the misuse of or the use of, of um, uh, drugs is, is a way of, um, you know, self-medication, mm-hmm. soothing pain. Um, and um, I think, you know, there's a lot of alcohol consumed uh, within the sort of upper class. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's probably the drug of choice. <laughs> um, and there's a lot of family dysfunction there as well. Um so, so yes, I think, uh, and, and in a way, you know, to go back to sort of some of my own uh, ruminations about my background, I mean, I think I'm also aware that in some ways I've been, I've been using my head to um, cope with some, some more basic emotional and, and uh, body issues in lots of ways. So, so yes, there's... there's um, and, and the other thing to point out is that you know, boarding school is an incredibly structured environment. Mm. You, you you are very rarely left to your own devices. And, um, you know, one or two of my friends have been in that, that um, environment um, are very aware about how they have to keep busy. Because if they don't keep busy, then some of the more underlying issues, uh, painful, disturbing, come to the fore. So it, it's, um, it's a highly organised, structured environment um, in which, in actual fact, there's there's uh, quite a lot of well, there's uh, you know a, a lot of balance as well mm-hmm. in, in lots of ways. Uh, so it's it's there is plenty of plenty of violence in that environment. But it's it's contained partly within the initially within the, or, or, or previously within the within the very hierarchical structure of, of, of fagging and, and um, uh, the the senior pupils having an awful lot of power over the junior. Ones. A bit of the Lord of the Flies situation, you know. <laughs> so sort of legitimised bullying, uh, really. I suppose. You got it, David. So you've been describing a varied picture. You've been telling us really that boarding school syndrome covers you know, a, a variety of presentations. We shouldn't assume that everyone is the same uh, who's in this kind of situation. I think that's that's helpful to to enhance our thinking about it. And you've well, been can, I, can I just add a point there? Yeah. I, I think, I mean, one of the kind of analogies I've been pursuing recently is between um, the idea of PTSD um, and complex PTSD. And um, in a way, you know, it, it took quite a long time for um, 
Judith Herman to, to differentiate um, more straightforward single incident trauma leading to PTSD to something much more mm-hmm. uh, chronic and ongoing and not, not necessarily major uh, traumas in their own right, the accumulation of trauma. Mm-hmm. And so, I mean, I, I'm, I'm kind of sort of, in a way, talking about in some ways you could call it complex or boarding school syndrome and, and, a, and, a, and a more uh, less complex boarding school syndrome. That, that might be also quite a helpful mm-hmm. distinction. Well, I think, um, like, Gabba Mate talks a lot about it not so much being the trauma as the response to the trauma, doesn't he? And I think that perhaps becomes significant as well because lots of people do have experiences of abuse or you know kind of like big traumas as opposed to those little smaller um traumas that build on each other but there's something about what you're met with that enables you to then cope with the trauma so if you experience for instance sexual trauma outside the family home and you're able to talk about it with your parents um and receive validation and support then the chances are that's easier to recover from whereas if you're in an environment where actually those things can't be spoken of you know there is nobody there to offer the support and the comfort I mean, I'm curious about how much comfort is available in in boarding schools you know what what is offered in place of a of a parent I, I, I get that it's not going to be the same but is anything offered is there any attempt to to try and offer comfort to children um very good question Amy um, I mean, I think I have to recognise, you know, I went to boarding school in the nine, late 1950s, early 1960s, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and um, I don't think the word comfort was in circulation. Um, and it couldn't, you know, in a sense, because the whole ethos of the institution is to toughen you up. You know, there's, there's we're talking about sort of views of the world. I mean, I think if you use a word like comfort, you know, you're, you're kind of, talking about a sort of um, world which has been influenced by um, modern views of developmental psychology, of attachment, um, of, uh, I guess, people like us who are familiar with the world of psychotherapeutics. Um, You have to see the world of the boarding school traditionally as being completely counter to that. It had nothing to do with that. And, And... Historically, it, it goes back partly to aristocratic families who sent their, their children out from their own family to be turned into into functioning uh, night warriors. You know, I mean, if we if we unpack this historically, it, it has a very long history. Mm-hmm. Uh, coupled with um, the idea of, 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 of the church removing children from the family to um, indoctrinate them in the um, in the beliefs of Christianity. Um, so I, 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 in a way, I think you know, it's it's almost a different world, mm-hmm. and and just institutionally, it's very very difficult to replace the intimacy and the knowledge of a family with an institution. I mean, you know, even in in in, in sort of good social care, it's incredibly difficult, even if you take mm-hmm. a child out of a dysfunctional family, to find an institution which can really replicate. Um, what a good family would provide for, for a child, you know. It's almost a conflict in terms, I think. Absolutely. There was a, someone was posting recently an Ofsted report into a children's home up in the northwest, I think, and it was posted because it was amazing that this home was perceived as being such a fantastic example of how children's homes ought to be, that the, the house parents knew and loved the children and that came across the individualised um, care plans but you know I was I was quite um, shocked actually Simon when um, and I shouldn't be I realise but quite shocked when you said the whole point to boarding school was actually to toughen toughen children up so of course um, comfort wouldn't be figuring on the radar but uh, like having seen adverts for boarding schools that are still taking children at primary school age you you can only hope that the ethos that drives them has, has changed for those poor kids that, that go there now? Well, I, I wouldn't, you know, I'm, I, I think, as I say, I mean, I think in a way, you know, I'm, I'm a bit of a legacy. Um, and I think, I think Duffel himself has got stuck, stuck a bit in the past since he keeps referring back to this film made in 1990, making of them, mm-hmm. which, is, which is a very powerful film. 
one could say yes, but things have changed, and they, and they have to some extent, I mean, you know. I think the fact is, I mean, it, it goes back to this sort of um, question of whether an institution, yes, they're more comfortable, the food is better, you know, there's not ice on the windows in the winter, etc., etc. The fact is you're removing a child mm. from the f- familiar, familial environment at an age which, which, is, which is much too young. And um, more than a third of these kids now come from overseas. Yeah. It's a bit like in the old days, like something like Rudyard Kipling sent back from India, you know. Um, so these people are being transported thousands of miles to a completely alien environment, probably um, a climate which is very different, possibly not, uh, likely not to be speaking their, 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 their mother tongue, you know. And what, what's going on with these children? Yeah. Um, in a way, they, they, they're just customers, you know. And, and so I think that while you, if you look at the brochures which these places put out at the moment, they, they, they've taken up some of the language of childcare. You know, I really question that, that's the fact, whether it gets gets to grips with the um, uh, the emotional. It, it can't, you know. I mean, I, actually, I just don't think you can. Sometimes you have to remove children from from families, mm-hmm. you know. But don't don't kid me that in actual fact, what you what you put in its place is 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 very much like a warm, uh, caring, intimate mm-hmm. family environment. Mm-hmm. It can't. Yeah, of course. So, Simon, you've you've given us, a, I think, a very good description of uh, intergenerational trauma um, and how it gets developed and perpetuated in in the upper classes. Do you have any thoughts on how this kind of trauma affects other people in? society, how it may be perpetuated in other groups in society. So that's a, that's a very good question, David. Um, and uh, it's it's a it's a bit difficult for me to answer it. I mean you might have a better answer than me. You know, I I I, I come from the upper class, not I mean, by no means as well as well implanted as, as, as other some other people I know. I mean, Alex Renton, who I know, and who wrote Stiff Upper Lip, mm-hmm. I don't know if you're familiar with it. Mm-hmm. On his mother's side, he's the 12th generation uh, boarder. Well, I can only go back to my half French um, grandfather, you know, who went to Eton. Um, so, in some ways, my family's quite nouveau. Um, uh, I, I think this is something we really need to have a discussion about because I, I carry my own social baggage and I've been trying to find a way out. Um, and I suppose in some ways I'm, I'm quite amazed by um, the lack of pushback from people who don't come from my background. And one can see this again in the case of, of Boris Johnson. You know, how does he get away with it? Um it's my, it, it might be something the three of us could have a little discussion about. Um, I, I, I'll give you one or two suggestions for what I think happens, um, but, but they, they may not be close to the mark. Um, I think there's this this thing of um, it's almost kind of um, I think one of your questions is something about class. Um, well, it's partly the accent, isn't it? It's partly the, the the, the body posture is partly an, an assumption that you hold a position of power in society. And, you know, that's actually kind of very, it's a very powerful thing to have. Um, other people perhaps feel feel dependent on people like me um, for their job, for their place in society, for a certain kind of shame which is projected into them. Um I mean, do you remember Osborne's comment about the Sherpas? I mean, it was a disgraceful thing to say from somebody in his position. So Sorry, he immediately what was kind it? of Simon, what, what was it? Um, it was he, he was he he was. Uh, I think it was in in the kind of in the early stages of austerity, and he was trying to divide not himself but the rest of society into two groups. Hard workers and the shirkers. Yes, right. it was a, it was a kind of classic divide and rule yeah. device. 
which people from my class have been using for centuries. You know, we know how to do it very well. But then in actual fact, what you do is you, you, you then set a subclass against each other, you know. So you stand there as the kind of um, authority voice. And, and uh, you know, Osborne's got money coming out of his ears. And then lecture the rest of society, saying that, yes, you know, some people are kind of staying at home and not working. Those things about mm-hmm. pitching curtains. I mean, he laid it on with a trowel, you know. And I just thought, you know, this this is this is very clever manipulation. You can only do that sort of manipulation from a position of um, uh, entitled security, you know. And the trouble, I think, I think, I think I'll, I'll stop in a moment because uh, I could go on. But, but I mean, I think one of the other problems is that the commentaria commentators in our society quite often come from a similar or aspiringly similar background. So they never quite tie these people down. So Johnson actually is never pushed to state how many children he's got. He always gets away with it. I think he can only get away with it because there's a sort of deference which is, is so built in to, to aspects of the British psyche that nobody dares to, you know, say, um, the emperor's naked. I think you're right. I mean, I don't know how you see I'm really interested in how you experience it. I think it's been going on for a long time, hasn't it? I was reading about the capture and the ransom of Richard the Lionheart the other day, and of course his ransom represented about 25% of the uh, GNP at the uh, time, which uh, took us, as a British people, a long time to pay off. Well, it's like the money paid to the slavers, you know. Indeed. Yeah. Uh, but I read um, in Glorious Empire recently about um, obviously the British in India, and it was interesting that you talk about it's that. Partly my background. Yeah, well, it was interesting that you talked about the divide and rule because that was a striking thing that I took from the book. Actually, was how much those same strategies have been used in Britain with um, it, within the class system as are used overseas. There's very much that that way of. Um, dividing the the lower classes so that they so they're too busy um criticizing each other rather than critiquing the people who've got this power over them and i I suppose you know you spoke also about people there being a difference between people who go to private schools generally as well uh, from those that go to boarding schools and i guess if you go to a private school generally you go home and the chances are there are kids on your street who don't or who live nearby you might go to to clubs you know sports clubs where you're interacting with kids that that don't have that same privileged education whereas if you're at boarding school the chances are everyone that you interact with is in that environment and you know the messages within those environments you know the kind of posters that are up that tell people that they are amongst the elite that their place in society when they finish school is going to be in the top top level they'll be mixing with politicians and what have you it's quite hard for that for those messages not to drip feed in and sink in in a kind of in a way that other people get, might get messages about their low self-esteem you know that well, I, th- I think you've put your finger on something there um it, it's 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 very self-perpetuating um which is why, at least, uh, you know, I think it's a, a sign of the times that, that um, you know, the private education policy forum has sort of finally thought, yeah, maybe we should we should stop lumping them together. Mm-hmm. Well, that's what you know, we take quite seriously. Um, so it, it's it's a very insidious process, um, and I think there's, I mean, <laughs> this is jumping uh, slightly, but. Um, I think because of the Black Lives Matter uh, stuff, um, because Alex Renton's latest book, actually, and I know Alex a bit, is called Blood Legacy, mm-hmm. which is about his family's involvement with um, the slave mm-hmm. trade in, in West Indies. Um, my French family went, went east to Bengal, um, which is a somewhat different situation. It has some parallels. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh he, he pointed me towards a very interesting Jamaican uh, psychiatrist healer who, who I'd never heard of until a couple of weeks ago called Dr. Frederick Hickling. I can certainly give you some links to him. That would be good. Um, and he's actually come up with this. I mean, he's a brilliant man. Um, 
uh, sadly died last year. But um, he he has sort of completely deconstructed um, the effect of um, colonialism in the West Indies. Um, and he, he talked about um, uh, white European psychosis. And I think he's meaning that in a, in a, as a kind of social psychopathology, which um, is ser- terribly difficult to recognize and name. Um, and uh, this, this is in fact uh, what, what drives the appalling excesses of slavery. But, you know, we have our, our own sort of internal um, colonies and people at the top of society, um, uh, metaphorically anyway, get away with murder, you know. Um, we have our own, and, and Hickling talks about owning our own madness. Mm-hmm. I think this is a very difficult area to unpack, and I think we're only starting to do it. I mean, I think I think we're putting our fingers on some very insidious um, destructive elements in our own society and culture, which, um, which we actually have to to now finally um, confront and unpack. Um, and you will know, I mean, you, I'm, I'm sure you're well aware, I'm not telling you anything you don't know, that so many people who end up in prison end up there through no fault of their own, really. Mm-hmm. It, it, it's socially determined, you know. Yeah. They, they didn't stand a chance. Um, and once you're down at the bottom of the pile, chances of getting up again are really quite, uh, quite small. Um, well, absolutely, and I was just th- I was just thinking actually the difference in terms of how we you know the so for instance the financial crisis being caused by uh, reckless behaviour of bankers thinking about the all the corruption around the PPE contracts where people have you know been a, a, a awarded millions in contracts with because of who they know um you know dodgy deals um and how differently that's treated from the person who shoplifts you know the baby baby food from their um supermarkets um because they actually can't afford to to feed their child you know gross discrepancy in terms of what's seen as being legitimate and what isn't let's let's put a kind of name on that i mean i think which is where Fred Hickling's word psychosis is, I think, useful at least to point out the market. There's something mad about that name. Yes. You know, there's something mad in a culture which, in actual fact, can't make those links, you know, which lets them go by. I mean, there's a kind of total dissociation at one point because, you know, I think most of us would admit it's wrong. You know, if, if we could stop and think, even people at the top would say, yeah, that's, that's not right. Mm. But somehow it, it, there's something in our culture which prevents us from actually calling it out. Mm-hmm. Um, well, that that brings me nicely as nicely onto our next question, actually, because I wondered if trauma being uh, perpetrated by upper class people might be harder to address. It, you know, is it legitimised because it's embedded in the structures of of the establishment, so disguised in some way? Well, it's. Um, it's it's almost unaddressable. Um, yes, of course, it's hidden, um, and uh, I mean it's it's sort of almost a definitional problem um, because I think that um, and this is where it gets complicated because because who actually defines trauma? Mm-hmm. You know, in a way, it's the medical profession to some extent and the psychotherapeutic profession. Which for a long time, I mean, this is where the innovation of, of, of Joy Chavron and Nick Buffer was at least to say, look, bullying schools are creating a problem. Mm-hmm. You know, when I started going to see an analyst, you know, back in, I don't know, the um, 1980s, there was no notion that it's my the source of my problems, you know. So it, it's, um, I mean, in a way, one has to come, I for, my, for me anyway, it, it, it comes back to, to some sort of, of norm of care uh, and specifically early early child infant care. And, I mean, I think it was Bowlby's genius, for me anyway, um, picked up by Sue Gerhardt and, and mm-hmm. by Judith Herman, um, although she's American, so I think her background's a bit different. Um, but, um, you know, 
Olby saw that um, without that very early care, all sorts of things go wrong. Mm -hmm. you know? um, we have to dissociate from the pain. Um, we act out or we self-soothe. Um, but I think it's it sort of I think it provides um, a sort of uh, a different sort of norm, which is quite difficult in our society because we are actually saying, look, if you if you don't give kids their right right sort of nurture at the beginning, all sorts of things are going to go wrong. Um, so it's a kind of baseline. I think as a culture we find it very difficult to identify baselines. Um, and in actual fact, if you judge the sort of mores and, and the kind of traditions, the upper class against that base baseline, they fail at almost every turn, you know. Mm -hmm. Not only is the pedagogy wrong, the, uh, the uh, traditions within the family are wrong, mm -hmm. you know. Um, it scores appallingly, you know. yeah. um, but somehow because uh, you know, because they're at the top, uh, because they in actual fact set norms, because they dictate, because you know they can say who is a shirk and who isn't. It, it's incredibly difficult to call it out, um, and, I, and I have to confess, I think the psychotherapy professions have been a bit, it's been slow on this as well, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so and um, you know I think we're all complicit. In some ways, yeah. Well, I was th I was just thinking, Sam, as you were talking about poverty and how little that's spoken of actually as a trauma, and and yet how frequently that's spoken of with certainly people I've worked with in prison about the poverty, absolute poverty within their families, and how stigmatizing and shaming that poverty was. That meant that you know they didn't have enough school uniform so they often smelled or you know they couldn't wash their school uniform frequently yeah. enough because they had no washing machine and there wasn't enough of it to have a change of of clothing and hardly their fault is it they? well exactly and yet that poverty is inflicted but so you know the, i suppose what comes to mind is jacob reese mogg celebrating the fact that we've got so many food banks in this country um you know that's a poverty that is inflicted on millions of people in this country it's heartbreaking to think about how many kids are growing up without having regular you know enough food to eat and yet people are very quick to make judgments about people who use interpersonal violence and, and obviously that's not okay either but actually there are millions more people affected by poverty than will be affected by violent crime you know it just seems to go yeah, unaccounted and, and, and what, for and what, what you're just saying has sort of brought me back to um adverse childhood experiences mm -hmm. um because i think that um Possibly one of the weaknesses, certainly in the American form of the child experiences um, uh, questions, is, is it didn't focus enough on, on, on poverty. Mm -hmm. um, I would say, yes, poverty is a big ace, really mm -hmm. big ace. Um, and it's also one of the dangers in, 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 in a sort of rather blanket term, white privilege. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of white people, if we're going to use that sort of binary, not privileged. Um, so yes, I mean I, I I I'm I mean and it also circles back a bit to my involvement with the London Aces Hub um, and the fact that I was the first person to discover that the term adverse childhood experiences wasn't coined by Dr. Felitti in 1998. It was actually coined by John Colby mm -hmm. in 1981, and, and I want to make that link rather firmly or very firmly to the um, detachment tradition. Um, because Bowlby understood that, mm -hmm. maybe not in the first dimension, because the neurobiology was much less uh, developed in those days. Bowlby knew that if, if you if you didn't have that right early nurture, um, not only did it do you damage, but it in actual fact laid you open to further damage down the line. It was a kind of two-stage process. And I think we can see that, Naomi, being... being um, enacted all the time, you know, and, and I suspect people, um, you, 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 you um, uh, encounter in the criminal justice system mostly have an IA, high A score. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I, I don't know the statistics, but we, I mean, we know an awful lot of people in the criminal justice system have health. Mm -hmm. um, I, I guess it's, but again, you, you know, 
it, it becomes very compounded because if you if you if you're not if you're not functioning well mentally you're not going to be able to earn a decent living you know mm-hmm. it, it it becomes a very vicious circle and in some ways I, I thank my lucky stars that I came from a background where there was still enough money left over from the Indian enterprise to prevent me falling into the gutter you know and sometimes I hate to think what what would have happened to me if I'd come from a if I'd been as mixed up as I was and had come from a really poor yeah yeah quite a start quite a startling thought and I, I suppose earlier you spoke about it you know it took you 10 years of therapy to realize even what you wanted going forward and I suppose for you know for people who don't have um, many financial resources. Therapy is expensive. There's big waiting lists on the NHS, and what you can get on the NHS is often quite short term. But also that sense of if it takes a long time to realise actually what you want to change and be different, you know how disadvantaged people in the criminal justice system or from other groups of society where they don't have many financial resources um how disadvantaged they are in terms of getting what they need from therapy also you know you have you have the chance to figure that out but but other people wouldn't have that luxury necessarily i I also wondered simon whether you know class is is obviously something that you've spent a lot of time thinking about and i wondered if you have you always been conscious of your class and class difference or is that something you came to later in later in life uh good question um i i don't think one is you know i don't i I, I think, well, I, I mean, this is my view now, that, that, that social background is a bit like um, water we're born into, you know. I mean, I don't think any of us are probably that aware of it initially. It's just the environment in which you, you, were, you were brought up, you know. And, I mean, I, in some ways I'm upper class, but in other ways I come from a rather peculiar background. Uh, as I said, there's a sort of... Uh, French connection, which then got mixed up with the Raj. Um, my great grandfather ended up, who was French, ended up in Worthing because he married an English governess. Um, and then, in actual fact, my father, um, who was sort of uh, his father was self-made, but they were tenant farmers. He didn't know anything about this, but I did find it out after he died. Of course. Um, but he brought a small. He 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 he. He went to um, a public school, Eastbourne College. He sent me there. He was actually very successfully acculturated there. Ended up, um, went off to become a Royal Marine at the age of 17 at the Royal Naval College of Greenwich. Uh, ended up in the fleet air arm. Uh, and I'm sure he thought, at one point, he thought it was just sort of a rather romantic adventure. And then got caught up in the Second World War. Um, had a, some hor- horrific experiences there. And was a prisoner of war for five years. Um, I, I carry some of that somewhere. Mm-hmm. You know, we we all have these kind of family idiosyncrasies. Um, then he bought a small farm. He never once made the connection between buying that farm and, and the history of his own family. One of the things I've I've, I've discovered and, and, and regret in a way is that one of the problems with this kind of um, boarding education is it cuts you off from uh, your your own family history, your own family capital, mm-hmm. and I mean I've come to see my mother as somebody who was completely lost. Really, she didn't she didn't know where she came from. Uh, she 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 had no connections with her own French background. She sort of floated around and and had enough money really not to engage with the world very much. So I I was I was um, brought up the first sort of thirteen years or ten years of that that anyway conscious years on, on a small farm in the, in the East Sussex countryside so um, I, I don't think in that circumstance I was very much aware of my mm-hmm. my social background uh, and then I went to I was sent off to this um, primary boarding school you know, which was also in the countryside and it, just, it, it seemed to be the sort of thing that was done you know um, so uh, I think become Say, I, I suppose I became more aware in in my late teens um, 
because this was this was the um, 1960s, which was, was also a period of transition. You know, mm-hmm. um, uh, I now have a rather rather longer history than I care to to, to recall. But, um, I suppose that's when I, I became actually slightly embarrassed about my background, because in some ways it was it was a sort of rather vibrant working class culture which entered popular culture, the Beatles, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, I think I probably disguised my accent somewhat. Um, it certainly wasn't so, something that one, one flaunted very much. And the irony is, in some ways, it's 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 come come full circle because if you get to the 1990s, you know, in some ways, then new money and 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 the sort of um, Thatcher Reagan counter revolution, the neoliberalism was 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 in full flood. So I, I think, in some ways. Uh, we've, we've, we've gone full circle, and, and maybe now we're starting to come out the other side again, which is, which is, which is interesting, I think, and maybe one reason why we're asking some of these questions mm-hmm. in a more pointed way. Um, so, uh, no, I haven't, I haven't always been aware of, of, of class, and I think I would say it's only in the last year or two I've managed to, in actual fact, really, I think, integrate more fully. Um, the psychological side of myself with the more sort of social class side and see how they have interacted with each other. Um, I think it's, I, I'm not sure we actually have the vocabulary yet to, to, because psychology and psychotherapy tends to be very individually based, mm-hmm. yet in some ways we're now are more aware that so much of our, our own identities is socially constructed. Mm-hmm. Um, which is why I'm not entirely happy with this with this term, white psychosis. You know, because I think it, it, even the, the notion of psychosis seems to have a very in, individual kind of resonance. It's it's more like some some social psychopathology. We're, we're, we're certainly, high class is caught up in, but, but then I think lower classes are are um are. You know, are, are subjected to it, mm-hmm. but, but in a way, we've all been affected by the sort of the modern world. Mm-hmm. We, we, I don't think any of us can escape from it, um, which, which is where I think um, Frederick Hickling is right. In some ways, we all have to own own our own madness. It's it's not exactly equivalent, but I think there is what I think what I'm hoping. I think this conversation is 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 is, is part of that. Is, is to is to open up a space, and, and I like to borrow Winnicott's notion of the transitional space, mm-hmm. in which which we bring these very difficult, problematic ideas, and actually learn to be more honest with each other. And I think, you know, if if you come from an oppressive class, you have to earn the oppression. But if you if you're one of the oppressed, you also have to say, yeah, look, it, it, it affected me and didn't do me any good in lots of ways. But you know, I think this is a conversation which is only just beginning. There, I mean, I think it's a very important one, but not an easy one and very complicated. So um, I, I would I would say really, look, I'm, I'm still exploring this. Yeah, it's interesting because I think throughout this conversation, it seemed like there are lots of commonalities actually at two at the two extremes of society. You know, they're kind of the more the more affluent and the the ones with with less affluence. Um, so that kind of like embarrassment of the accents, I thought was quite interesting to hear you say, having been in situations where. I've I've gone to pubs down south and heard people mocking my northern accents in a quite disparaging way. Um, so it's it's interesting to hear you, that you'd you'd had a similar experience. So just a really tiny question for you, Simon. How how do we start to change things? Have you got any thoughts on this? And how do we do that without people feeling guilty and ashamed and becoming defensive? How do we have these conversations in a broader way? Um, well, I was quite interested in your word disparagement. I mean, can we learn to talk without disparaging each other? Mm. I think that's 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 the challenge in a way. Um, and I think I think what we've been engaged in um, uh, is a sort of um, mini example. Mm-hmm. You know, we've, we've 
um, you know, you've invited me into, into a space. Um, uh, you know, I've, I've, I've been invited to un- unpack some quite difficult things. You, you, you've, you've got one or two quite difficult questions in my direction. Um, but in a kind of a not an unfriendly way, you know, not a disparaging way. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, mean, I think one of the things I found so disappointing about the whole Brexit debate was the lack of debate, you know, how, how crude it was, how it became so binary, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, there was no no place to do it, an up the fact, explore very, very difficult, important questions. And... Um, to some extent, you know, the, the sort of modern media are helping, but uh, and, and the irony is, it's been so difficult, hasn't it, over the mm-hmm. last eighteen months or so with COVID, for people that need to meet face to face, and this is a sort of um, uh, substitute in some ways. But I mean, I uh, I like this whole idea of citizens' assemblies. You know, I mm-hmm. mean, I, I think we have to create spaces where some of these really difficult, painful issues in society, you know. Uh, like why 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 in a rich society like ours do we tolerate food banks? Yeah. You no. Know? Why are rich families allowed to send their kids away at the age of seven? That's that's child abuse. Mm-hmm. You know, the fact that they're rich kids is not here neither here nor there. Mm-hmm. You know, what's going on? Um so my 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 response really is to is to is to um I, I think we have to create more of these forums, you know, and and, and I think I think you you've got a little prototype here. Well, I think you you know you're you're hitting on something. I think with the way that that we as a society manage to have discussions. I'm just thinking about two really offensive terms that have cropped up. So, in relation to Brexit, you hear the word gammon being used to disparage people who voted for you know a certain kind of person who might have voted for Brexit and you, and then I suppose when you're talking about race you also hear the the term Karen being used as um as a way of disparaging and and all that does is push people further apart doesn't it and then you see the amazing um work that's been done with there was that um an Asian filmmaker who went and interviewed members of the Ku Klux Klan and um it, it, incredible, incredible work being done by treating people with respect, even when you know they might not seem to be inviting that. But actually, what does become possible when you're willing to have some respect and curiosity about the other person's position? So I, I wondered, Simon, whether you yes. wanted to say something about you, the London Aces Hub, actually, given we're talking about how we create change. Um, I just wanted to throw one more word into sure. the, your, your, your list there. That, that's the word woke, you know, which is being used as a kind of insult. Yes, yes. Um, um, so, uh, yes, I mean, I, I think... Um, and I got, I got into into Aces before I discovered the connection to Bowlby, by the way, which is which is quite interesting. I discovered that by accident. Um, was very pleased, um, and because um, I certainly have been uh, motivated very strongly by the whole um, uh, attachment uh, relation movement. Um, I, I think when I got to seventy, I kind of thought. You know, um, unwelcome um, uh, realization that, that the road doesn't go on forever. You know, um, and uh, I had this idea, partly inspired by what went on in Scotland. I mean, I don't know whether you're familiar with the ACES movement in, in Scotland, mm. or, um, but um, a woman who I've got to know quite well, Suzanne Zedai. Mm. Um, uh, organise or help organise this fantastic conference in Glasgow in September um, 2018. Uh, and about the same time, the, um, the film Resilience started to, to circulate apparently in London. Are you familiar with Resilience? Yes, yes. But okay, perhaps, you, perhaps, you, perhaps you'd like to say something more about that? Well, um, 
It was made by Robert Redford's son, Jamie Redford, who, who sadly is, is also deceased, um, died of cancer um, last year. Um, but it was um, it was a brilliant popularisation. It's, 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 a, it's an educational documentary, really. Um, but it took um, the ACE idea um, off, off the... Um, Psychotherapy um, books and, and off um, for Litty and and and, um, and uh, research. I mean, are, are you are you familiar with the A study? Yes, yes. But again, if if you want to say something about that, because we might have listeners. Yeah, well, I mean, it was a sort of it was a, uh, I mean, it's a it's an academic epidemiological study of 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 a, of a sample of. 17, more than 17,000 um, patients from um, Dr. Litty's um, health maintenance organisation, Kaiser Clementi. Um, but it, it was the first, I mean, I think, it, I mean, I got to know it in bits. In fact, I, I reviewed a book with it in, in 2012 and didn't realise how important it was. Um, but, it, you know, it's, 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 it's a very thoroughly argued piece of but, and it kind of more or less, uh, I think, sort of uh, puts beyond reasonable doubt the connection between trauma and, and ill health, mm-hmm. not just um, mental ill health, but physical ill health. You know, it's, 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 it's very difficult to, um, to brush aside a um, study which has such an evidence base. And I, I think most people accept it, you know. And it's a bit of a light bulb moment if you, if you haven't sort of thought that way before. It's, it's a paradigm shifter. Um, uh, but for people like us, David and Naomi, who who who, who live in our heads a bit, but, but most people don't. But when a film comes along made by Robert Redford's son, who was a it was a brilliant independent filmmaker, and was speaking obviously from his own experience mm-hmm. of difficulty, um, it was you know it, it it appeared at the right time, and then it was followed up by this um, conference in in Glasgow, which was fantastic success. success. Successful, and um, in actual fact, Suzanne's written a, a very good piece about, about how it happened. Um, and I suddenly thought, oh! Uh, and then I met I met somebody else who who'd been to the conference and who happened to live in London. I discovered. I thought, oh, well, you know, as a as a kind of bit of a, a firework display before I kind of disappear into the background. Wouldn't it be nice to organise a similar conference in London? Um, and because of my work on devolution and stuff, going back, I mean, I've, I've, I'm quite convinced we have to have a more decentralised political system. You know, it can't all happen. So I was quite clear it was, it was going to be London-based. It was going to basically talk to London, which has its own sort of rather feeble assembly, but it does have it. The idea, from my point of view, was a big, big sort of firework display. You know, it had a, we'd, we'd hold a big conference. Um, lots of sparks would fly out, it, it'd land, and goodness knows what would happen. <laughs> As a swan song, it seemed quite an attractive idea. Uh, and of course, we got ambushed by COVID. Yeah, and yeah. So, uh, yeah. So, you know. Um, but, it, you know, the idea is, has, has survived, and in actual fact, I'm, I, I think we've created a very good um, uh, website, and some, some initiatives are, are getting going, um, but it's been hampered. By, by COVID, like everything else, um, and uh, yeah, it's um, uh, the strap line. It wasn't invented by me, by, by um, Journey, who was who was the, one of the, the. I suppose were four conspirators really initially, um, uh, and and she says uh, spreading the seeds and joining the dots, which, which in a way I think is what what we're doing. Mm-hmm. You know, it, it's 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 trying to provide a space where. Um, some of the good practice can, can be elaborated and passed on, and um, you know, in some ways, the strap line is is trauma, trauma informed. You know, mm-hmm. we, we, the ambition is to make London a trauma informed uh, city. Mm-hmm. Um, let's, let's aim high. But we, we need a trauma informed society. You know, and we need a trauma informed and an eco informed society. You know, and uh, if we don't go down that road. You know, our our, our our arrogant species is finished. Mm. You know, it's, it's curtains. I mean, you know, the writing's on the wall. 
So, I mean, I think these things are sort of starting to come together. Um, but, you know, there's, there's, there's the pushback from those who want to keep their heads in the sand, mm. hold on to their positions of power and the old ways of doing things. So it's, it's an interesting uh, moment to be in. I wish I was 10 years younger in some ways, you know. Um, but it sounds like a, yeah, a good... A link to the hard work. Right. Yeah, well, it sounds like a good initiative for, to to have got going. But David, I wasn't sure whether you wanted to say something. I'm conscious, I feel like I've been hogging the interview. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, that's fine. I was I was just wondering, Simon, whether you've come across the uh, enabling town slough movement. Um, I was just picking up on your description just then. Um, have you heard of that? Uh, vaguely, yes. But it's a long way down my horizon, David. You know, I can't, I can't pretend to send it any great familiarity. No, no, that's not a problem. I'll, s- I'll send you a, a, a link. But, but that's also a place where they've been trying very hard to do the kind of um, things that you've just been talking about, really, to create new places for people to get together and to support each other and talk things through. Yeah, it's quite a l- Yeah, I, I'm sorry. I was just going to say, I think there's quite a few cities in America as well, aren't there, where they've been trying to really make themselves trauma-informed cities. So it just seemed to be a bit of a moment for people trying to harness some kind of collective energy, which which obviously is going to be more powerful than than one or two people plodding along. Well, I mean, the ACES movement in the, in the States is um, it's almost mainstream now. Which has its has its uh, advantages and disadvantages, you know, because it, it'll get caught up in the, the system of power if it's not careful. Um, but um, Adine Burke Harris, who, who came to Glasgow, spoke spoke at Glasgow, um, uh, went back to California, and um, somehow got the governor to create a. A position for for herself. She's now called the Surgeon General of California, and is running this this statewide ACE program, uh, which has the goal of reducing ACEs by half within a generation. You know, when the Americans get an idea, they pick it up and they <laughs> run with it. So uh, you know, I mean, uh, there's lots of stuff going on there, which which um, makes what we're doing here look, look rather pedestrian. Mm-hmm. But it does it. It's in an American context, and it has its advantages and disadvantages. But um, yeah, it's, it's happening all over the states now. You know, um, they talk about the the ACE collaboration. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's 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 pretty it's pretty mainstream, and uh, you know, people like Winfrey Opry are, are, are promoting it. Um, I was trying to think the other day who who in who in the British media would would uh, promote uh, ACEs like Winfrey Opry. I couldn't. I couldn't sort of find the the, uh, the equivalent. Mm-hmm. But um, okay, every, every every bit we do, these these little conversations we're having, it's it's actually all adding to something. And I, and I think you're right, David. There are, there are these kinds of um, initiatives that are opening up, um, and it rather depends which side of the bed I get out of in the morning, whether I feel incredibly depressed or, or quite elated. Well, that, that's quite that's quite interesting that you should say that because we've just come to our final question, Simon, which is, you know, generally one that we ask of most people that you know you've been immersed, very immersed in a subject area that shaped your life, and how do you keep yourself positive about the possibility of change? So, is it through oh. you know involvement in things like um, the London Aces Hub and the boarding school survivors? Is it that sense of activism that gives you? Um, a sense of being able to keep going or are there other things that that you draw on to nourish and enrich yourself I enjoy my garden mm-hmm. I've never completely left, left mm-hmm. the countryside of my childhood mm-hmm. um, which is quite an interesting link back into, into things ecological actually mm-hmm. um, so I, I do I do uh, get, get an enormous amount of um, uh how can I put it? Um, sort of sustenance from from, from nature and, and 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 the complexities of nature. Um, 
and uh, I've been very intrigued by Robin in my garden recently who um, I got two or three really friendly Robins aren't Robins fantastic I mean they have mm. this sort of um, you know there's, there's, a, there's a, there is actually a kind of Robin um, primate species relationship they, they know how to use us we <laughs> like it a lot <laughs> There's been a robin in my garden pecking at the grass. I think, what's he doing there? In actual fact, there are quite a lot of ants in the grass I've discovered, and he's he's going there and he's kind of getting a, an ant breakfast. Maybe not very good news for ants, but um, it, it's. And I've always been impressed by the by the absolute, you know, beautiful complexity of nature. I mean, David Attenborough I think captures it very well. Um. And really, I think, you know, our species needs to... Um, maybe i just end on this note, because it was a thought into my mind. I mean, I, I think we've... Um, and it gets back to a comment we were making earlier on about using our, our, our minds too much. Um, you know, uh, the intelligence we, we deploy is, is, is nothing compared to the uh, ecological mm-hmm. intelligence that's all around us in nature. I mean, we live in the most incredibly complex of systems. And we're really rather crude and we've stop bumping around, you know. Mm-hmm. That seems a perfect note to finish. Simon, thank you very much. That's been a really thought-provoking conversation. I'm really grateful to you for coming on today. Oh, it's, been, it's, been, it's been a pleasure to talk to you and, and, and one never quite knows what's going to happen. But it's been, I, I found it a very interesting and productive conversation. So thank you too. It's certainly been a pleasure meeting you, uh, Simon, and to have this conversation. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. So it was good to hear Simon talking so much about uh, Bowlby. One doesn't hear so much uh, these days about those people who are working back in the uh, 50s and 60s, but it also brings to mind, to me, those awful conflicts and... um, the conflicts between therapists and psychoanalysts at that time and one can't help wondering that although it all went into the great pool that was thinking about um, uh, relational working and object relations work I can't help wondering whether the kind of conflict somehow inhibited the, the spread of those ideas yeah, that's an interesting, interesting idea, isn't it? Because um, I know when I was training that, you know, we, John Bowlby even then seemed, so we're talking about kind of like 25 years ago, and John Bowlby's ideas then seemed to be being presented as innovative, even though it was quite a long time after he'd been theorising. But yeah, I think really interesting to hear this perspective from somebody from a very different segment of society than Mm. people typically are when they find themselves in prison but you could see so much of the same kinds of um the same kind of dynamics that people had been exposed to whether they be in care um or secure children's homes as people being sent to boarding school even though they're coming from this background of relative privilege um which is just heartbreaking isn't it when you think about so many children being subjected to that and and like i say still seeing adverts for boarding schools that take children below below um secondary school age many thanks again to all of you who have listened to our locked up living podcast feel free to mention this to your friends and to your colleagues and give us feedback on our webpage lockeduplives.com and our Twitter account Locked Up Living. Many thanks too to Pete and Rach who kindly allowed us to use their music You Have Called Me Courage and this is available from all the usual outlets. <laughs>